So for all of you who know Detlef, this is my younger brother by four years? You're close to him. Yeah, four and a half years or something like that. Uh, I'm Bob. I've been living in Africa with my wife for 28 years. And it's a part of Africa that I actually get to share with you guys because normally it, on the internet and other ways of sharing, yeah. <laughs> and I want to clip that part out when I, when I show where I am. Because, well, actually, it's okay because it's all on this sheet. And if you could, somebody could distribute these. That will give you an idea of where I've lived for the past 28 years. Uh, Do you want to that? Yes. <laughs> I have, uh, I am a member of an organization that is called Wycliffe Bible Translators. Has anybody heard of that? There's one. Uh, it's also known overseas as SIL, which originally the founder who started it was, it was called the Summer Institute of Linguistics. Wycliffe Bible Translators, which was the recruiting branch, started much later. The Summer Institute of Linguistics, I wanted to give you a little bit of a background on that, because um, it started with a Christian man who decided that he wanted to share the, the message that was in the scriptures with the people of Guatemala. It was, it was just around the time, or just after World War I, that he went down to Guatemala. And his idea is he thought, well, Guatemala, they all speak Spanish there, right? <laughs> well, he, he decided he was going to sell Spanish Bibles. And so he went around. Uh, his, his name was William Cameron Townsend. And he went around Guatemala selling Bibles, at least trying to sell Bibles in Spanish. And so he needed an interpreter in the end to actually sell Bibles. Does that make sense? He learned some Spanish himself. Does that make sense? You need an interpreter now. Interpreter in what language? One of the local languages. And so, in his attempt to sell the Christian message, he was confronted with the reality that nobody would understand the form that it was coming in, that he had in his hands. And one day, it was particularly, there's one story about William Cameron Townsend when he was using his interpreter trying to sell Bibles to people and the village chief came and he was saying something a bit aggressively and William Cameron Townsend said, what, well, what did he say? Can you translate? He says, he said, if your God, this God of this book is so great, why can't he speak my language? <laughs> and he asked him, what is your language? He said, Quechua. language had never been written before. <laughs> and he was the pioneer in going out into these small language groups and translating the New Testament and part of the Old Testament, the Christian scriptures, into that language. He went back in the summer months to the United States, and now it was in the it was after World War II, and he started to he started what was called the Summer Institute of Linguistics. That's where it got its name. It started in a bar. He just put advertisements out in, in, uh, in the newspaper. He said, well, I really like doing this. It was kind of hard. I had to, had to go from church to church and ask for support to do this thing. And so he said, maybe there's some other people who want to do it too. And that's how he started the Summer Institute of Linguistics. Little did he know how many languages there were in the world that uh, he was imagining maybe a couple hundred. You know. <laughs> Does anybody know here how many languages there are in the world? Actual languages that are being used today? Twenty to 30,000 or more. Well, you're, you're really enthusiastic. <laughs> There's 6,000. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I've got a little all over. <laughs> <laughs> There's 6,000 languages in the world. There are plenty of languages that have also become extinct. There are languages that are becoming extinct. That is true. And part of our organization is also trying to record those languages and create dictionaries and uh, put them on the website. Uh, so, yes, 
Yes, there are lots of languages. So the amount that's actually being used right now, or that that has like a million people using them, is more like a couple hundred. Probably more than that. A one thousand. There in in Africa, the average language group, the size of the language group there, are generally between twenty. 15 to 20,000 people. That's because there are 2,000 languages in the continent of Africa alone. Where I work, you can see from your map, uh, is the country of Cameroon. Can you see that? It's kind of not an easy map to see. stayed home because I'll be continuing. She would have been here, but I'm continuing to Northern Virginia getting on a flight. So that's what we look like. And that was the truck that we used to get out there. Are you still in Africa? I'm going back and forth for the next couple of years. We're just finishing up now. So um, this is the area of Cameroon, the area of Africa where I'm working. It, it borders the Central African Republic, Chad. The language group that I work in goes across those borders. And there's 15, like I said, it's about 15 to 20,000. Some groups are bigger, OK? Like if you go down south, there's some bigger groups there where you maybe have a million speakers of those languages. Okay, so you're kind of right on that. The ones that are actually common. Mm -hmm. Bob, isn't it, just quickly, isn't it um, true that sort of the common language there is French? Yes. Okay. In this part, down here in this part of, this is Nigeria, by the way, in this part of Cameroon, there are actually two regions where they speak English as an official language, official government language. The rest of Cameroon is the, the language, the official government language is French. And that's because of the colonial things that happened there. It used to actually be German before World War I. And then the French got this part. <laughs> so there's still some very old Cameroonians who remember that and can speak German. Uh, yes, I put, I, I put, uh, you can see that map of West Virginia. <laughs> and the reason I put that there is, okay, there you go. It's to show you the reality of the situation that I'm working in. This area, these little circles right here, it are where the particular language that I work in, where these people live. This area right here, which goes across into Chad, is uh, the fatherland, where that language is uniquely spoken. And these are displaced groups that they've moved, they've migrated out. And when I first went, when Yasmin and I, my wife's name is Yasmin, when we went to Africa, I had hoped to be in one of the groups where they were more compacted maybe within 25 miles of one, and, you know, the whole language was, was situated within a 25-mile uh, circumference. But instead, we were eventually <laughs> assigned to a language that was about the circumference of West Virginia. <laughs> so imagine working in a language where you're trying to develop a language, work on a writing system, translate this into the New Testament, and working with a community that is spread out all over a, a vast area like the circumference of West Virginia. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the language. I'm going to talk a little bit about myself too. 
Uh, believe it or not, I'm dyslexic. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I can explain that to you later. But for those of you who know, it's real hard to learn how to read and write, basically. And uh, I credit who I believe in, and that is the Lord Jesus, in helping me get to into linguistics. Uh, Learn Bible translation principles. I mean, when I went to university, there were people who were typing faster than I could read. So, uh, what you have in front of you now is, I actually need one of those, I think. <laughs> you can look on one. Is um, part of the book of Acts. It's one verse out of the book of Acts. And I will read it so you can hear the language. Uh, and then I will share to you the unique parts, of the unique sounds of this language. The language is called Karam. Namtim bi pentakot ka njukri e kan lao satun gerbai gong hani gerbio kibil bul kani ngerza dale kula chidi pe mbe kinunba bo. Eng Baukuna Ginyagel Kumboni Hani Kumbonia Mi Kukope Eng Rimhoro Ti Nunwe Mi Kair Yu Tulwe Mbiambio Bam Bale Tempukiya Munwe Bam Bara Mi Kubasai and just my bana Kiri Bot Bot Batil Kandoko Ke Temp there are pre-nasalized consonants here. And if you can see those, they are marked in pink. Uh, every time you say a consonant, like a B or a G, the first thing that happens is it goes through your nose. So you have, instead of B, you have M-B. You hear the difference? M-B, B. Instead of D, you have M-D. Instead of G, you have M-G. <coughs> then there is also an implosive consonants, and these are kind of fun. My wife had a hard time learning these and mastering them because the reading in Karang had two of them. And that would be, instead of B, you have B. What you're doing is you're creating a suction in your mouth, and then you, ask, you kind of semi-aspirate at the same time when you're pronouncing it. So you create a suction in your mouth, and then you say, B, instead of B, or D, for D. And those have, if you can see here, they have, they have hooks on them. So you have B, D, and then you have what I call the three Stooges one. Y, That's the why. And that's a little bit difficult to do, because you, you have to do that with your mouth open. You're creating a suction behind your tongue. Then you have, uh, in the red, you have uh, a double consonant, which is you pronounce two consonants at the same time. You have the G and the B, and you have K and P. So you have B and you have P. Did you hear that? Good. The exact same. You're saying P and K at the same time. Good. Huh. Good. You're saying G and B at the same time. Good. Good. Can you hear that? I hear book. Wow. Okay. I'll, You're I'll, saying book. Okay. Normal B. Book. And then with the with the double consonant G in it. Book. 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 So that gives you a bit of the flavor of the language. And the last one I'll share with you is the is very unique to the language. It's called a labial dental flap. And it's symbolized here, and you can see the yellow. It's, it's symbolized with a V and a B. And it's hello. Hello. <laughs> Basically, curling your tongue over your teeth, and then as you
you're aspirating and vocalizing, it flaps your your teeth just a bit. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> and here we have what they call an idiophone, which is very hard to pronounce. something loud, a loud noise from the from heaven, and they use this idiophone. Boo, 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 boo. Boo, boo, boo. And they can say it fast. I, can, <laughs> I can't say it fast. Okay, here. Here's your flavor of the language. Um, when we arrived there in this part of Cameroon, the language was had already been written down because there had been already missionaries there before us who had put it into writing. And so there was actually a literacy courses, there were literacy courses going on in the community. And this is, this is interesting the way it turned out and why perhaps I was supposed to be there as a dyslexic. And this is the next handout. when I was studying linguistics, uh, I was studying uh, phonetics, and that's and and that was in Norman, Oklahoma, and you had to have you had to learn every single sound that has had a linguistic symbol, and so you had to master these sounds, and one of the sounds was a bilabial click. You know what a bilabial click is? Bilabial flat. That's a bilabial. That's actually a sound in a language. And so I was sitting there, <laughs> I was sitting there in class, and they were practicing this, and everybody's going, <laughs> and I just, I just couldn't, I couldn't do it. I was just laughing. And then a teacher comes up to me, and it's a woman, and she goes, just go. See this text here, I can, and now it's on the screen. I can give this to somebody who doesn't have it. Uh, if you can see this text, it's the exact same text in the Quran language, but one is the previous way that it was written, and one is the is the way it's written now. If you look at this right here on the left side, what do you see? calling them accent marks, maybe you study French, and so you know they're accent marks, right? But here, they represent tone, because the language has four levels of tone. Wow. And what that means... Which one is up? <laughs> yeah, this one, this one is a high tone, it's going that way. The low tone goes this way. And then, the ones that are not marked on the vowel, like here, that's a medium tone. And then you have another one right here, where it goes up and down. And all those are significant in understanding the meaning of the oh, words. You're saying that's the pitch. The pitch is in. Yeah, tone. you can call it pitch too. You call it tone. No, it's a difference in the way. You can, let me give you some examples. The word for knife is moin. The word for wife is moin. So you have moin. You have moin and you have moin. Okay. The word for scorpion is ndai. The word for cow is ndai. Ndai, ndai. So I'm exaggerating so you can hear it. <laughs> and so you need to be able to distinguish these things. The problem was that the linguistic theory at the time when I got there was that if it's a tonal language, then when you develop the language, you need to write all these marks on there so people can read it. Okay. And as a dyslexic, I went in there and I looked at that. And I'm going to these literacy classes and I'm watching people trying to write this. And it was very difficult for them. And what it comes down to is that English is, a, if I can compare it to English, English is an intonational language. 
okay? That means it does have a tone in it, but it's at a phrase level. When you're asking a question, <laughs> you raise your voice at the end. That's a tone shift, okay? But it's intonational in the language. It's, it's more at a phrase level. Do we write that in English? We don't. We just put a question mark. That's our clue. Okay? And so we don't write intonation in English. But if we did, it would be impossible to write the language because none of us would master it. We do it automatically. Or we do it by context. And so because I, I studied psychology, I studied psycholinguistics, and because I was dyslexic, I looked at this and I said, this is going to put people backwards in their own language to force them to write like that. And so, uh, by God's grace, I did a study, a, uh, a study in psycholinguistics, and we compared different writing systems, and, we ne and in that we were able to prove that nobody was either reading this right or, or, or writing it. And we came up with this one right here, where there's still some marks of tone, but it's very limited. It's either grammatical tone or it's just a few lexical items. And you know what happened? When we taught the literacy, literacy teachers the new system of writing, they were so happy. They said, Bob, you know what? I said, what? He says, now we can even teach the women how Oh, just a <laughs> <laughs> It was so hard, you know, we can only teach to the men, right? Uh, they're so much smarter. <laughs> but it's true. They, now they're actually, because the, even them, the men couldn't master it. But now that, now that it's we're simplified, they, they, oh, now we can teach a lot more people. We include women. Oh, thank God. Our people are grateful. We're grateful. <laughs> I have a quick question. You may get to this, I don't know, but um, one of the things that really fascinated me about what you guys were doing there is the fact that over the development of having a written language, people were able to start preserving their cultures in a written yes. way. Yes. And if they um, did that before. I'll bring up one example. They, in their culture and in their language, it's very important to have this thing called ringina. Ringina, what is it? It's uh, a name that resounds. Okay, a name that resounds. In our, in our way of looking at it would be to have a family tree and a record of this family tree and that your name would eventually be in that family tree and that your children and your children's children will remember your name and your children and your children's children are faint are are become important people and then they refer back to you our grandfather who is now passed on and that would mean that you have a rinkina because your your children's children remember your name now the problem was that nobody remembered their grandfather's name. Although the concept was there in their language. Okay? So, what, it, what do you find in the New Testament? The genealogy. You find genealogy. Yeah. Right away in Matthew, you find a whole genealogy. All the way to Adam. <laughs> and so when we were translating that, I used it as an opportunity to challenge them. And I said, here we're translating this. And they're going, wow, this is really neat. You know, it goes all the way back. And I said, okay. Now, what about you guys? Do you remember your grandfather's name? Um, let me ask my dad, you know. And they would kind of dig, and they'd find it out. And then I started challenging them. You know, look, if you see this in the Bible, and you know it's important, it's important to your own culture, now you can write, okay? You have a writing system. And so I... Uh, we had a whole program where we asked them to write their village histories. And so they have 12 village histories now that they wrote. And in it, they were able to put the investigate with their grandfathers and write down who were the people who started the villages, when did they come, why did they move there, and all the names. And they're all written down now. So that, in essence, this linguistic work that we're doing is actually going to preserve a concept
concept that they have in their culture in a much better way than it had been. Because they're lying orally, they can write it down and have it saved for all time. That's right. Time. Yeah. And it's already started. And crop stuff, too, right? Um, but um, certain ways of doing things that mm -hmm. work better. Yes. Uh, yes. That's right. Crops, uh, we made some uh, help help booklets. You know, how, to, how to apply uh, pesticides because they're required to do it by the cotton company and things. How to do that in such a way that you're not going to harm yourself and, and things like that. Or how to put There was stuff about health, too, health books and things like that. And that's one of the things that our organization does. We find a need. AIDS, that's another big one. And we, we put out materials on AIDS and so that this generation now knows how to protect themselves from AIDS. Uh, I read this to the group I was with yesterday about what we, my wife and I went through the 28 years that we were there. Um, if there's any questions and you want me to go into any of these things, I could do that if there's time. Uh, this happened over, I just put a list together. We were attacked by the spirit world. We were scorned by religious leaders. We were in danger from bandits, kidnappers, poachers, bushfires, venom snakes, corruption, foreign exploiters, uh, I lost my place. Yeah. and ac yeah, accidental burns. I rolled a truck once. I was held at gunpoint. I had malaria, schistosomiasis, multiple parasites with long names and long bodies. We had exposure to tuberculosis, scorpions, broken bridges, or about to break bridges, impossibly muddy roads. I had an engine blow up on me twice, once while I was looking at it. Uh, I was robbed, pepper sprayed. We were bitten by dogs. I watched people die of rabies, malaria, AIDS, a lot, and meningitis. Lost some acquaintances to venomous bites, water buffaloes, elephant attacks, and to poachers. Other neighbors died from lack of surgeons due to traditional medicines poor beliefs, fake doctors, lack of blood, and worse yet, toddlers from alcohol poisoning at the hands of their own parents. And I saw the cruelty of, euthani of a youth the euthanizing of a helpless child. Once an elephant chased my truck a quarter of a mile with a load of children in the back. They were all screaming. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> That was due, by the way, poachers addressed these elephants. Uh, I was accused of sorcery, killing, embezzling, exploiting, and assumed to have a, to own a magic camera. And I'm also friends with the evil Mami, Mami Wata spirit in the river. Another rumor. These are to name a few, th a few things. And I am very glad... God never gave me a preview of all those things. Jurassic Park would have been better. You guys even lost a dog to rabies, right? Yes. I had to put him down myself. So, that's just to tell you that I don't look at myself, because a lot of people, when I do this, I give a talk and I share about what we did and about the Karam people, they don't realize how many times they just wanted to run and get out of there. And 
for some some miracle that God did, we were able to get all the way through to the point now where their language is moving ahead. This translation is moving ahead. And for those of you, I don't know how many of you have actually read through the, the Christian scriptures, the New Testament, the Old Testament. Not cover, cover. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Years ago. There's a lot of good stuff in there. There really is. And I'm going to tell you a story about how this is changing the corrupt culture. And I believe in our own histories, European or American, there's a lot of good teachings and a lot of good things that Christ taught that have influenced our cultures to the point where we are what we are today, as compared to perhaps what Cameroon is now. Uh, I will use the example of what's happened in the church over there. The scriptures were first introduced in the 50s and 60s to this group of people. And what had happened at that point was, as soon as they heard it in a foreign language, which was a trade language, Fulfude, they heard it from a missionary in the Fulfude, which was, they heard that in the, in, the, in the markets. Right away, they started saying, hey, we need to build chapels. It, it took off like that, as soon as they heard the Christian message. And it was years later, after this pastor was already gone, and I came into the picture, that I realized what had happened, why these people responded so positively to the Christian message. And it was because they have what they call a redemptive analogy in their culture. If, let's say, you guys are are one, right? I don't know if you are or not. <laughs> You're sitting together, okay? You get in a fight, right? And, you know, it's one of these things like, Well, in their culture, if there's that kind of divide between two people or two clans, two families, then they believe that the spirit world, the ancestors, are, are going to send illness. The spirit world is going to bring uh, more problems into their lives. The spirit world, world will, for instance, uh, give him malaria. That's in their belief system. And the only way to bring about a reconciliation that's solid is to have uh, the opposing parties, if it's two clans who are fighting, they get together and they take an animal, like a goat or a sheep or a chicken, and they will butcher that, they'll slaughter the animal, and it's a blood sacrifice. And when that blood is poured out on the ground, they are holding the animal together, the opposing parties. They realize they want to have reconciliation, but only a real reconciliation can only take place in that culture by the spilling of blood. Do you get the picture? So here's a missionary who comes in, and they also have a concept of Ngevza, the big spirit, the one who's over all, and that's what we use for God. They have, a, they have that concept. And so now they're hearing a different story. They're hearing about this man who came, and what happened? He died on the cross. And his blood was spilled. Literally, we have that picture where the blood is pouring out of his body. And that was what they said, whoa, wait a minute. You mean this big guy that was so distant, so far, has actually used our own system and our own culture to want to be one with us. And that's how it took off. That's how Christianity took off there. They put that redemptive analogy into it, into their this new thing that came in. And so, but quickly thereafter, uh, things got corrupted. <laughs> and if any of you are familiar with lots of different denominations, they usually start well. <laughs> and then things go downhill. And so 
the church that I came into, I had been actually hoping that when we were going to start a translation, that this particular church denomination that had been there ahead of time would be enthusiastic about what we were doing. Because you need people behind the language work. You can't just be doing it on your own. And so the biggest institution that was there was this church. But I quickly realized that when I got there, that they weren't too happy about using the mother tongue. Because uh, I went to church. And the pastor was preaching. And what language was he preaching? Can anybody guess? He was preaching in French. You know who understood French in the congregation? It was like the school teacher, the medical worker, the government worker over here. They all understood French. And so the pastor, he's being a big man, he's showing off that he knows French. Kind of like speaking in Latin in some of these old Catholic churches. Right. Some of them still do it. Right. So that the motivation, we're kind of replaying, Africa is replaying the whole Middle Ages now. And this, believe it or not, is a Lutheran church out there. Okay? And so, I saw that. And then, when it came to announcement time, the pastor switches to pulpit day. It's about politics. It's about church politics now. He wants all the men to understand. <laughs> he wants all the men to understand. Okay? So going to blow a gasket. <laughs> Good ending. This, this story has a good ending. Just hold on. <laughs> uh, so he's asking all the men, basically, we're talking about church politics now. The women are sitting there nursing their babies. Uh, and then it comes to the announcement about providing food for the catechists who are all getting together in the village, and he switches to what language? The mother tongue. To the Karang language. Because he wants the women to understand that they need to cook. <laughs> so that was, when I first got into the village, that's what I saw. And I said, wow, I don't know if the church is going to get behind us on this one. Because the leaders are using this as a power thing. They're using language as a power thing. Uh, so, where's the good ending? I've been working in this system for a long time. It was only five years ago that I had hope that something would change. <laughs> only five years ago. And a, if any of you, there's a story in the Bible itself where there's a prophet in the Old Testament who really feels like he's overwhelmed. He thinks he's all alone. And he's saying, and he's praying to God. He says, God, where are the others who are with me in following you? Where are they? They're not here. Nobody's here. And then he tells him, and he reveals to him, that there's a bunch of people there. And a vision. And it was like that one day for me. I was uh, uh, in the northern area, the, one of those circles. And I just gotten through a very frustrating meeting with a lot of these really frustrating to work with leaders. And in the evening, there was going to be some celebrations. There were going to be young people who do this thing called uh, concerts. They call it concerts, but what it is, it's a competition of choral groups from different churches. And they, and they get together and they raise money that way and they sing and they dance and they use amplifiers and uh, I was really tired. I just went through a whole day meeting. It was night. It was hot. I was in. Uh, I was in a, a little. They gave us a shelter. It was, had a metal roof, and it had been heating up all day, so you couldn't really sleep inside. And I was just miserable, and I just wanted to be alone. And it was one of those moments where even I was like that prophet, and I was saying, "Where, where are the people who are going to work?" Where are the people who are actually going to benefit from the things that I'm doing? And in the darkness of the night, my wife was sitting next to me outside this thing. There was a little cement step that we were on, and it was dark. And in front of me, I see people gathering. 
one by one coming in to this little enclosure that was in front of the place we were living. And as they were gathering, they started to form a circle. And I was looking at them. It was dark. And I was looking at them. I said, these are young people. They're like 15, 20, age, the ages of 15 and 20. And, uh, and in all my frustration, all my, uh, that, that angry state that you sometimes get in, okay? Suddenly it was like, wait a minute, we need to listen to this. And the next thing I noticed is that this group didn't have any church leaders in it, these guys who were doing this thing. And what did they start doing? They started praying. I said, wow, see what's happening? They're praying. And I started nudging my wife who was falling asleep. I said, look, 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 yes, man, look. They're praying. They're young people. There's no passion. There's no catches. And then I started listening. Do you know what language they were using? just surprised. I was just taken back. And it brought me all the way back to the days that I was in university. <coughs> and I was in a group like that. We get together, young people. There was no pastor. There was no, we just pray. You know, we read the Bible together. We do, you know, kind of like a group like this, right? You know, we are encouraging one another. And here it is taking place in front of me. And I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> and that group, later on, they started challenging the system and saying, you know, we want to use our language. And there are lots of girls in the group. <laughs> there are lots of girls in this group. And they said, they challenged the elders. They said, we want your blessing on us, and we want to use our language, and we want to have a Bible camp every year in our language. And we're and here we are just finishing translating the New Testament. And so, of course, my wife and I, we got right in with this, and this group has now had four Bible camps. And each one of them is basically run by the children themselves, the young people. And, and as a result, and this group, you know what they, you know what they have? Believe it or not, in Africa, in the middle of nowhere, they have Android phones. And if I get mine to work, I need a child to help me. <laughs> okay, right there, there's an app that we can use that has the Quran New Testament. And this is, for instance, this is Matthew. Book of Matthew. It's in there. It's their language on their Android phones, and they're using it. Okay? And during these Bible camps, they're starting to see what Jesus is teaching about. Okay? There's a lot of things in the scriptures, there's a lot of things in the in the New Testament.